that's what social baseline is speaking to. That when we have those connections, just a look in the eye, a momentary glance, a pat on the back, transforms the system in the direction of feeling safe. And when I feel that, I feel more open than to the next person who comes in the door. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapist Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. Absolutely. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now hear your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey everybody, Sue Marriott here with Therapist Uncensored. I cannot tell you what a privilege it is for me to be able to bring to you a friend and colleague, Bonnie Badenoch. We had a short period of time on the Global Association of Interpersonal Neurobiology Board, where we worked together to bring this material worldwide. And in addition, in Dan Siegel's advanced training classes in Los Angeles, that's where I really got to see her shine. I'll tell you her gift, just in plain speak, this is not on her bio, but her gift is that she can bring the cognitive sciences and, you know, these, these Harvard therapists that are talking about neurons and neurology and all these things, and she can make it alive in the room, which is something that I aspire to do, and I hope that this podcast does. Bonnie is considered one of the premier kind of therapists related to this. So for 25 years, she has supported trauma survivors and those with a significant attachment wounds to reshape their neural landscapes. And I love the sound of that, right? because that is really what close relationships do. And the direction is towards a life of meaning, resilience, and warm relationships. She also does these year-long immersion workshops for folks. And I know that many people that are in these and they just get stars in their eyes. They love working with Bonnie so much. In addition, she has published a couple of really great books, Being a Brainwise Therapist, A Practical Guide to Interpersonal Neurobiology. That was in 2008. And then she followed that up with a Brain Savvy Therapist Workbook in 2011. And then finally, we're excited to say that her latest writing is in the heart of trauma, healing the embodied brain in the context of relationships. That's 2017. All of these things will be linked in our show notes. The point of all of these books is to build a bridge between science and practice with clarity, compassion, and heart. And so it is with my just delight to be able to bring to you all Bonnie Badenoch. Thank you so much for listening. Just to launch really quickly, like I was just reading a chapter in a book that you wrote, and the title of the chapter is something to the effect of safety is the treatment. So I thought that might just launch us right into a conversation. Can you expand on that a little bit? Right. Well, the first thing I would want to say about that is that I'm actually quoting Steve Porges, the father of the polyvagal theory, who says that, that safety is the treatment. And I would say that of the many people who've influenced me, Steve is right up at the top of the list as far as how I understand not just therapy, but human relationships in general. I love the idea that what we seek most and what opens us most to being able to heal or being able to be close with one another is the sense of safety, but in a particular way. You know, we can probably all of us say, well, I'm with somebody and, you know, we're safe and all of that. But there's really the neurobiology gives us a very particular definition of what creates safety for one another. And that is when we are truly present with another person with a non-judgmental presence that has no agenda except to be there. And that's pretty rare in this world, actually. You know, usually we're trying to either help somebody figure something out or we're thinking our own thoughts while they're talking, those kinds of things. And it takes really something to cultivate the capacity to just be there and open to wherever the other person is without judgments or if we have them to release them quickly and also without any agenda for what should happen next. So that creates the feeling of safety. I'm just laughing at all of us who go into the profession of therapy or any of the healing professions, 
that's already a threatening statement because so many of us want to help people. So <laughs> it's like if we're not being helpful, you know, that we can begin to push our own agenda, which counters your definition of safety right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, well, what's most helpful is to be present. I think, think I think about it for myself. So, you know, if I'm having some kind of, you know, emotional experience of some sort, what I want most is someone who can be with me in a calm, open way and really listen to me deeply. And that, for me, is the most helpful thing. I think that's the hardest part of this is imagining that that kind of listening and that kind of presence, whether it's with our kids or whether it's with our partner or a client or or the teller, you know, at the bank, that that is really what our systems crave is to be received that way. And then we can go on from there. You know, I might say to somebody, so can you help me think of some solutions for this? And then I'm open to hearing what they have to say. But first of all, I need to feel received. I need to feel that without judgment, this person really is interested in what's happening for me in this moment. Right. And part of what I, why I was laughing about that is that it means that we have to set aside our need to be more immediately helpful, you know, that being able to sit with someone in pain and just be with them is different than our perception often, where many times where we come from, where we go into the field thinking that we are going to help someone not be in the kind of pain that we're called to sit with. So that was the chuckle. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. I mean, I, and, and also our training, actually, honestly, guides us yes. to think about protocols and all of these different ways of helping people that are more directive. And there's a place right. for that. But the place isn't when we first are with someone. And also, really, I, I mean, I seek as much as possible with in all my relationships to follow where the other person is and offer what they might be open to. But again, I think if the, if we as humans could go into our own felt sense experience, we would realize that what we need the most is first the listening ear. I have a good friend who works with rape survivors, and one of the things that she shared with me is that what this person said to her was that as awful as the rape was, the most awful thing that happened for her was when people would interrupt her in mid-sentence, when people would try to fix her and get her away from her pain and would not just open and listen to her story. And she said that was ever so much more painful than the original incident. Yeah, that is so powerful. And I'm thinking about the students and everything that are being indoctrinated with this, you know, evidence-based practice and things like that. And that would be flooded with what they are supposed to do next to be good clinicians versus what you're really espousing and what you're known for uh, about this embodied presence and really getting all the supervisors and all the the board and everybody out of our head and really just being able to open our ears and our heart and our mind and our gut and being in the moment. Yes, and it's also, interestingly enough, a lot harder on us. If we're able to do that instead of working so hard, so earnestly to try to guide the session or the time with our kids or whatever, if we're in that more open state ourselves, we'll actually be less tired at the end of the day. Our brains will be more integrated and all of that. So it's good for everybody. I mean, that's the beauty of it, I think, is it's really how we're designed to be with one another. And so a therapist who is constantly having to, you know, think about this protocol or that protocol or what can I do to make this change is usually in what we call sympathetic activation, which Mm -hmm. is a sense of of needing to control something. It's a sense that something's wrong here and I need to straighten it out. And that is much harder on the system than it is for us to be in the kind of open, receptive state. And so, I love things that are good for everybody. I think that that yes. really speaks to to who we are as humans, you know, that when things are good for, for everyone like that. I love that. It's more of a natural state of being. And I definitely want to get into what you're beginning to speak to, which is the polyvagal. Um, but before we leave this concept of safety, I also, as a clinician, and I do a ton of group therapy, and I have the sense that sometimes, this is going to sound weird, but Sometimes there's an over or a misunderstanding of safety, I might say. So, for example, this group isn't safe enough for me. And so it, be- it almost becomes used as a defense. And so I'm curious how that you might respond to that. So it's, it's almost coming at it from a different direction. And 
so I have worked with it in different ways, but like it's almost a, it becomes a shield to push against people of, well, I'm not going to do this because like that it's almost like a demand, you know? Yeah, it rings a lot of bells. I think when someone is having that experience that oh, this group doesn't feel safe enough for me, groups are very complex because within the group there are so many nonverbal signals that are being exchanged. And there's also inside of each of us, we each have our own way of perceiving in the world. So, for example, if I've had a lot of fearful experiences and some of them have been in places like classrooms or other kinds of groups, then the, my perceptual filter is going to read the situation as possibly more dangerous than from current experience it actually is. So when I speak in the group and say this doesn't feel safe for me, safe enough for me to open up, as if I were the group leader or even as a member of a group, I'd be curious about what's happening for that person that makes it feel unsafe. Because I do think it's a protection, but I think it's a very valid protection, often based on what our past experiences have been, and perhaps not knowing the group very well, perhaps some memory, implicit memory that's being stirred up by various people in the group, including the leader, and all of these kinds of things that make groups potentially feel less safe than a one-on-one relationship does, especially at the beginning. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, again, this goes a little counterculture, but that's okay. You know, it's therapist uncensored, so we get to (laughs) play with these ideas. But I think of safety sometimes as a privilege, you know, that there is a way that sometimes we can walk around the world feeling safe and expecting it when many people just don't have that implicit safety period. Right. And so I talk a lot about discomfort and comfort. And now this can get us right back into polyvagal. Right. And if we shift our thinking into our level of comfort and discomfort and move away from this absolute notion of like a up, down, safe or not safe, that it can encourage curiosity. And so what I will typically do is try to encourage people because that there's the absolute feeling of safety or unsafety can sometimes in my estimation in group can close down curiosity versus that what exactly is making you is sending your, you know, your nervous system into a feeling of discomfort that can become more talk aboutable versus if it's just, this is no longer a safe place. It's like your nervous system is encouraging you to tell a story that then closes everything down. And sort of I often will encourage people to notice that their neuroception is encouraging a story that then, you know, we want the story to be opening and recognize that the story is coming from the mind and it's being driven by the body. And we want instead almost like it to come to go the other way around. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm having an urge to tell a story. But can we just go right back to the body of like something is making me uncomfortable? Can we find what it is? So moving away from an absolute notion of safety and unsafety to comfort and discomfort feels like a productive way of working more towards curiosity and not knowing instead of a knowing. So I'm just curious about your thoughts about that, if that that feels like it's in the direction of moving towards the nervous system. Well, I think it's a really, I think a change of language like that can be very helpful because it does point back to sensing the body, uh, pausing to be curious about it. And I think that the words safe and unsafe have so many meanings. And of course, we're not talking here about whether we walk around the world in shoes of someone who's not sure how, uh, whether they'll be harmed or not on the street. We're talking about psychological, emotional safety, but because the word safe covers so much territory, it can be confusing. Right. So comfort and and discomfort is, I think, is a lovely way to speak to that. I think we can talk about when people say they feel unsafe, I think, again, we can ask questions, change language, whatever we need to, to be, to really, even in a feeling of unsafety, if I'm receiving that person without judgment, without agenda, and then I can yes. begin to help them move toward curiosity as I'm curious yes. about what might be touching them inside or outside that leads to this feeling that they don't feel safe in this room right now, you know. And, and right. But again, always legitimizing it that there is a felt sense reason why the person is experiencing that and they're not just trying to hide, but that their nervous system and their neuroception has picked up something either in their internal world or their external world or both 
this isn't the place for me to open up all the way. Right. Or this isn't the time. Right. Yes. Yes. So that yes. respect and that validation that their system knows what it's talking about and that I'm yes. open to listening to what this system has to say that speaking, whether it's a language of safety or comfort or whatever it might be, you know, that, that we can be with that as an adaptive response in the moment. I have found that that kind of respect that we are always adaptive, that there is no such thing as maladaptive experience Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is really helpful because I think, first of all, it's the truth. And it also is a respectful way to approach everyone that lets us be open and curious rather than getting judgmental. Because as soon as we drop into judgment about whether one person's experience is correct or not, we are no longer present for them. And the situation actually gets less safe. And I've heard you speak before about the notion of co-regulation and auto-regulation, and that perhaps there's not such a thing as auto-regulation, that, that it's all, whether real or imagined, whether it's interpersonal or you can say it much better than I, but I love your concept of that it's all co-regulation. It's all us needing others to regain a sense of stability and internal security. I mean, this has been many years since I've heard you say that. Is, is that kind of still where you land? Oh, I think so. In fact, it's sometimes interesting to see people's responses when I say, when I say I'd like to talk about the myth of self-regulation, because there's a huge emphasis in our society on self-regulation, self-reliance, and all of these kinds of things that point toward a society that values the individual isolated experience over the community experience. And it comes because of, you know, something that I don't know if we even want to talk about it today or not, Sue, but it it comes from whether we're looking through the left hemisphere of the brain or the right hemisphere, because we have two ways of perceiving depending on which part of our brain we are most using as our means of seeing. In other words, all of the brain is always doing everything, but there's ways to look at the world that are relational and there are ways to look at the world in terms of tasks and behaviors and more of a self-reliant individual kind of way of being in the world. And our society is the latter in spades, more than perhaps any other culture. So it leaves us feeling very alone. And then this idea of self-regulation and self-everything else begins to take root. So that's just a little bit of the backstory. But what I'm really most interested in talking about is the way that our regulatory circuitry, meaning our ability to calm down when things have stirred us up, gets built is with another. So I'm born and I have this warm, loving mother who, you know, isn't perfect and does all kinds of things and makes mistakes and makes repairs, but in general is a a reflecting, loving, caring, warm, present person for me. In that scenario, two things happen. Well, probably hundreds of thousands of things happen, but the two that I want to want to talk about are that the actual circuitry in my brain between the lower parts of the brain, the subcortical and the orbital frontal cortex and middle prefrontal cortex, those areas that are a little higher up, those get woven together and give me the capacity to be able to settle more easily in what looks like on my own. But it's never really on my own because the other thing that happens while my parent, this loving mama, let's say, is interacting with me is I'm internalizing her. And she Mm -hmm. becomes a very alive and present inner resource for me. So that when the circuitry is regulating what looks like self-regulation, there's also this inner mama who I feel, who since I feel usually below the level of conscious awareness, that's also in this regulatory dance with me for the rest of my life which is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And that's true mm-hmm. for everyone who's been with us in a non-judgmental, curious, open, warm way. We internalize those people and they become an inner team on behalf that are our inner regulatory team. So most of the time we only talk about the brain circuitry that's developed in those relationships and not the fact that those relationships become permanent and become a forever source of warmth and connection, of hope, of the capacity to bounce back from adversity, resilience, all of those things. And those inner people are so important. Sometimes that, though, will get overwhelmed, and then we really need to also have people on the outside. So we never get to a place where we only need the inner team. We also need each other on the, in the outside world. I love you saying that because it also it brings in developmental psychology that 
has almost gotten a back seat with all the neuroscience and internalized representation. It's a really important point that you're making and also the hope. But also what can happen, of course, is that if it's not a loving mother, if it's a scary mother, that that can also get internalized, which is some of where that the self-hate and these implicit memories of that I am bad can come, but it still goes back to that we need others to soothe ourselves and to have healthy, secure relationships, that we're going to need that, whether we are imagining it like David Elliott has been doing this ideal parent imagery, whether we create it inside our minds, whether it uh, is remembering, you know, consciously or implicitly old relationships or you know, forming new relationships, whether it be therapists or friends or sisters or whoever it is. So clergy. Yes, absolutely. Or the divine for that matter. Uh, that, exactly. I was about to say that spiritual presence, all of that, mm-hmm, for sure. I mean, I take small issue with the idea of creating an internal idealized parent. First of all, if I have never had that experience, it's going to be largely a mental exercise rather than a felt one. And we're not really designed, we wouldn't ask a baby to create an idealized parent. What we would do is is be that person. And so I suspect, I'm sorry, I missed his name, but I'm guessing if he's teaching this technique, what's really happening is that they're internalizing him more powerfully than they are creating something from whole cloth inside out of an experience they may never have had. We really need the felt sense of others with us in this non-judgmental, curious, warm, reflecting sort of way in order to build up something inside that's equally alive as a human being is rather than something we've had to make up. I get very uncomfortable when I hear therapists want to say, you know, we want you to learn to parent yourself to a client. It's like they don't know how most of them, if they had early attachment struggles, they have no model inside. And instead, if we can offer ourselves and make it really easy for them to internalize us and even speak to how important that is, you know, that we're here together and we're taking each other in and we stay together even after the session, and all of that, we begin, they begin to build up something right within this core neural circuitry that was missing as a child and that really is present now. And we do it the way the body and mind were intended to do it. So I might make some people unhappy saying this, but I, it's something <laughs> that I feel like it's very important to speak to. Well, you're not at all. As a matter of fact, the technique starts where you're making protest. It's that it came out of that exactly. And, and basically where it starts is that the therapy relationship isn't enough. And so it's actually a anyway, I mean, this isn't kind of why we're here, except that he has been on the show and people are very excited about it. And so if it were just parent yourself and make it up, I would totally agree. But it's actually very exciting because it's not that it's a very, very well researched and it's got some really good data behind it. And it is, it says, as a matter of fact, it really protests anything about if the client even begins to think of parenting themselves, they interrupt it. And, um, and it's a very felt sense, kind of deep, almost hypnotic, very exciting kind of new experience because of the limitations of just internalizing the therapist when these two really short sessions and it becomes very creative and anyway, it's just a new, you know, I don't know, but Carol George of, uh, you know, the AAP did some research on it and found some really good data about actually changing attachment status with people using this technique. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, all I'm suggesting is, is that the person who's offering this in this kind and loving way is yes. being internalized by the person yes. and is probably oh. the foundation for why it works. But we rarely in research look at the importance of the relationship itself as being the foundation. Right. Of peace. I'm certainly not suggesting that people should do this. All I'm saying is it's probably important to realize that also our our non-judgmental caring presence is part of right. any kind of offering Absolutely. of any technique that we do. Absolutely. And that is what builds the internalization. Absolutely. That's very much part of the model is it is a collaborative experience that is, you know, co-created with the therapist. And, you know, because the client will never be able to even think of what an ideal parent could possibly do because it would never occur to them. (laughs) I don't want to even say them, right, because we're the patients, too. So it would never occur to us. (laughs) It would never occur to us what an ideal 
parent figure. And a lot of times it turns out to be animals like uh, bears or something hugging them, you know, so it doesn't even um, but but for them to actually have a feeling of a big, strong maternal bear with their arms around them is a new experience and that one that they can take with them and then they bring pictures. So, you know, it's just another data point in these ways that we're trying to intervene and change the implicit memory. You've been studying this, you know, going back to your work for many, many, many years. And for our listeners out there, Bonnie is just, really, I see you as the expert at really pulling together all of these sciences and being able to bring them into the clinical realm and being able to really bring them alive in the clinical setting. Well, thank you, Sue. I, I think probably the gift I came into this came into this world with is synthesis, and so I'm always most interested in how the way these brilliant theorists and also the brilliant scientists, whether it's Porges and Siegel and Shore and Bruce Ecker and Ian McGilchrist and all of these have offered us something, and I'm fascinated by how they weave together into a very consistent picture that always indicates more and more how interdependent we are. There just isn't any research that moves in the direction that I know anyway of us being more independent than we think we are. In other words, we're always being shown our interdependence at every level. I don't know. I think it might be helpful in this regard to just talk a little bit about social baseline theory, which is okay. Great, yeah. crazy about, again, scientists going in and looking at what happens to our perceptions when someone trustworthy is with us. So Bex and Cohen are the two that, um, there's a third one I can't remember right now, but they did this research and then began to look at what it actually showed. What it shows is if I'm faced with a very difficult task or if I'm in pain, I will on my own perceive, say, this mountain to climb is almost impossible or the pain is quite intense. If someone comes in who I don't know but who generally feels trustworthy for me, the task looks easier and the pain feels less. But if someone comes in who's a trusted beloved and is with me, the pain is a lot less, perceived as a lot less, and the mountain looks like it's easy to climb. So there is this way that when we are a company, the way they say it is, I'm paraphrasing, but that we have evolved to expect to be embedded in a nest of warm, predictable relationships. And our whole mm. system is set to receive one another in that way. So then in the research, they thought, well, probably what happens when someone comes in like that that's our trusted beloved, probably our regulatory circuitry works harder and that helps the amygdala calm down. They found that isn't at all what happens. The regulatory circuitry works less, and the amygdala calms down all by itself with no help. Interesting. The presence of a trusted beloved brings both people to a state of calmerness in their amygdala without needing to use the regulatory circuitry at all. So then the prefrontal cortex and our other areas are free for more creative endeavors, whether it's to solve the problem that's in front of the two people together or whatever it is. So by doing absolutely nothing but trusting one another, it transforms our brain into a more calm, comfortable state. I love it. I love it, too. I mean, just what a protection of resources. That's right. Then all of that other neural firing that can be used for creativity and can be used for deepening relationships and all of that is free to do that. I think one of the dangers in our community is that so many people work in private practice and don't yeah. have somebody to relate to. Um, I had a nonprofit in California for 17 years, and I had a couple of licensed people, but mostly we had interns. And, and it was small. We were maybe 10 of us. But what was lovely was in between sessions, even if I didn't talk to somebody, it was almost somebody whose eye I would catch or something like that, and I would just feel my whole system settle one of my interns, one of my other therapists, and, and I would just settle inside and I'd be ready for the next person. And I never knew what that was about specifically, but that's what social baseline is speaking to, that when we have those connections, just a look in the eye, a momentary glance, a pat on the back, transforms the system in the direction of feeling safe. And when I feel that, I feel more open than to the next person who comes in the door. Right. It's like you've, it's like a clearing of the cachet. Is oxytocin related to this? 
I would imagine it might be. I would also imagine that GABA would be part of this, you know, as far as the neurotransmitter pattern, but I don't actually know the answer to that for sure. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. when I think of, you know, what happens when a trusted beloved comes, you would think there would be an upping of oxytocin and serotonin. Mm-hmm. If there's something mm-hmm. to be done, there might be some more dopamine, which leads us to be, this turns on the seeking system and leads us to be curious about what to do next. And of course, mm-hmm. things toggle, so there would be less of the of the stress chemicals in the right. body because right. if those others go up, the other ones go down. But right. the fact that all you have to do is show up, so you don't have to do anything for this to happen. <laughs> I I think that is so powerful. It is, and if we could all just get this through our thick skulls. <laughs> <laughs> it's really scary to be interdependent if what your rest of your system is telling you is that relationships are either not safe or if we're in this left shift aren't possible really at any deep level. Then it's pretty scary right. to open yourself to the vulnerability of that interdependence. So I can understand why it's difficult to do, but when we get the hang of it with each other, we've had a study group here for about nine years now that meets every Tuesday, and it's had different people come and go, I mean, one Tuesday out of the month. But we've realized that we come together not so much to learn something new, although we do that, but we come together because we really hear each other and we're present for each other, and it reminds us, bless you, and it reminds us of why it is we got into this work in the first place. And so by coming back together out of the pressures of insurance and everything else and private practice, we just stay together together. And there is, again, a, a palpable shift in the atmosphere as soon as people start coming in the door that, on that Tuesday. It's so powerful. And I'm thinking about our listeners, and we have a lot of listeners that are therapists, but we also have a lot of listeners that are not therapists. And people write us, and they some people talk about being lonely. And so I'm thinking about folks from all over that a way to apply what you're saying, Bonnie, to just anyone would be that any kind of social shift, and this again goes back to polyvagal, that any social shift, whether that be going and seeing a neighbor or taking your dog for a walk and making eye contact or going to work and working in your cubicle and saying hello to your coworker or like basically any move social, which is kind of what you're saying. It's It wasn't so much getting help with your cases. It was going and being together and just showing up together that any move that you can make, and I'm again, I'm thinking of people that are maybe very, very isolated, but that any move that you can make that moves you more into social connection is going to be in the right direction. From the vagal perspective, it's a good thing. It's, it's going to begin to turn on the feel-good hormones. But the important thing, too, is that those people be ones who are interested in really listening to one another, because if we Mm -hmm. get together with people whose predominant mode of responding when we talk about something other than the weather is to fix it or to offer advice, that immediately shuts us down from this place that we're talking about. And Mm -hmm. so we want to have at least a few relationships where the other person is interested in being with us and listening to us and seeing where we are and also knows can rely on receiving that from us as well. It's a mutually caring, receptive relationship. And then if a person wants advice, they'll ask. And if they don't, if they just want to be heard, I can't even tell you, and I bet you would say the same thing, Sue, how many times I've said this, this, and this to somebody, and I can tell they're really listening to me, and I feel better by the time it's done. I just feel better because I know I've truly been heard, and now it's shared, like social baseline theory says. It's shared, and therefore it's less weighty. And you know what? That means that the the person listening in some ways has to do less. You don't have to stress out if somebody comes to you and begins to tell you the bad news of their day. <laughs> you can put your hands behind you, do less, <laughs> but you open up your heart and your ears, which in some ways is actually much harder to do. But it's about showing up. It sounds simple, but it's actually, you'll notice as you're trying to do it with one another, you're still going to want to pick up the Kleenex or do something, you're going to want to take action and and go kick somebody's rear that hurt your person or (laughs) fix the problem or go talk to their boss or do something. And you're being invited right now to just really help them speak maybe or ask more questions or just listen and help them get their story out and feel heard. I know it's helped me really to become aware of how often my own mind is already making something up that I want to say while the person is still talking and then realizing that I've left them. 
You know, if my right. if my mind is mainly thinking about what I'm going to say next, it, to be helpful, I mean, it does not come from a terrible place, but it comes from a place where I think I I can be helpful, I can help solve this and all of that. The person will experience that as me having left them. Well, I love this because it's so applicable. There's not a person, there's not a single person in the world that this isn't applicable to. That even the most trained therapist, the best of us out there, or, or best of you that are listening out there, can be reminded of this. But it's truly whether you're, you know, you cut hair or whatever it is that you do in the world. Well, shoot, are you kidding? Those are therapists as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's no, you know, parents, everyone, that that capacity to be able to pause and hear and open and really hear, not just listening, but really taking people to heart. And all of your synthesis and integration, are there other things like that, that like the bottom line is, are there other kind of bottom line things of if somebody could really just, you could change someone by like, just do this. Are there anything else that comes to mind? of simple to-dos that people could implement. Yeah, I think that we, we kind of alluded to it for a minute earlier, and that is I first met Dan Siegel in 2003, so it's been about 15 years of working with all of these things and picking up different strands over that time. But what has gotten very clear to me is that everybody, everybody is doing the best they can do all the time given their neurobiological makeup and their genetic makeup to some degree, but mainly, mainly their neurobiological makeup and the level of support they have in the world. And that what people are doing, even people who are doing heinous acts, are doing those in response to trying to adapt to the chaos and all that's going on inside of them in some way. And when I can approach people with that kind of respect and with that kind of curiosity about what they may be adapting to, even when horrible things are happening, I find that there is a way that I'm perceived very differently and I may be in a position to be able to help by being present to that. Now, that's a big statement, especially in the world now where there's so much going on that is just horrendous. It was hard for me not to think on a more macro level right then. Well, it is hard not to think at a macro level, but I really find myself, again, years and years of working with this now, wondering about what's going on inside of various people, whether it's in government, whether it's, you know, whatever might be going on, rather than just jumping to the place of these are bad humans that need judging and need what this or that. Does it mean I think it's okay? Of course it's not okay. It's not whether it's okay or not. But I can stay in a place where I'm potentially of support to people if I can be curious about what ha what's happening for them right now that their system needs to be happening. Whether it's somebody who cuts me off on the road. Instead of thinking, you big jerk, more and more my mind will automatically say, gosh, I wonder what's happening in that person's life today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that Passion. leaves me in, in a different state that makes it possible for me maybe to be a therapeutic presence in the world more and more. And I have to say, I am by no means perfect at this, and nobody ever will be, but it's become a touchstone for me to come back to when I do get into that state of like, ah, I can't stand this anymore, to come back to that core curiosity, and I feel my system settle, I feel myself get softer, and I feel people respond to me differently. And I, I will... Well more than anything, if it's possible to be a therapeutic presence in the world in a way of that and also when there's ruptures of making repairs, but of really seeing people through as little judgment as possible, understanding that what the neurobiology has taught me is that we really are doing the best we, we can with given, you know, our entire setup. I love that. And, and there is so much hope. And, you know, when we first started learning about this, it was a little depressing because it was, you know, such a, your brain is permanently scarred and all this. But I love these messages now of so much hope because the more that we learn about our minds and the chemicals that are flowing in our bodies, like you're now by being able to be mindful when you're cut off in traffic, for example, you're saving your organs from these more harmful chemicals of the the stress chemicals, and then you're also more prepared to be able to be responsive and to be a light in the world and to be able to be this therapeutic presence that you're talking about. And that same message is available for other people as well. It's like protect your organs, protect your heart from this old brain 
that is trying to take over and tell you that there's danger and that we can, the more we learn about it, the more we're going to be able to modulate our responses. So I think that's a super hopeful message. And I think so, too. The other half of it, though, Sue, that's equally important is this does not mean we're going to walk around as perfectly compassionate people. The uh, Ed no. research early on says that for secure attachment, all you need is to get it right the 30, 33% of the time, and all the rest is ruptures and repairs. So a third yes. of the time, maybe we hit the mark, and this is on a good day, I imagine, and then the rest of the time we are open and human, aware of our human frailty enough to notice when there's been ruptures so that we can make a move toward repair. I don't think that my parents, for example, and most parents of most of the people I've seen or even who are my friends, were very good at noticing ruptures and making repairs. It's pretty rare in this world because it means there's something, and we would say from a left-shifted way, that there's something wrong with us, we didn't do it right. But if we can begin to have the expectation that every day with every relationship there's going to be little ruptures here and there that we can notice and that we can come back with a kind of happy humility and say, oh, gosh, I think I hurt your feelings. I'm very sorry about that. And make a repair. It strengthens relationships. So it certainly isn't about being perfect when we talk about this. It's actually becoming more humble and more aware of our human frailty and more willing to extend that in a vulnerable way to others. I love that term that you just said, happy humility. <laughs> it's, it's just, it has a smile on it. But what you're saying is that with the awareness, and if you're having these little awarenesses all the time, then you're protecting yourself from some of the sympathetic defensiveness <laughs> or embarrassment or shame or some of these things that can come with the overactivation versus when you're seeing it happen all the time. It, it's like, I have this little smile on my face now. It, it's like, oh, there I go again, you know, <laughs> or even there they go again. Let me give them the soft touch or let me give them my eyes or let, let me give them my breath. Yes, um, exactly. It's mm -hmm. so sweet. It's just such a great reminder. Is there anything else that you would like? And again, we audience, we have such a master with us right now. So we're sitting at the knee of uh, one of the mothers of particularly from a clinical perspective, not so much with the research, but but that like, I love what you said, the synthesis of like, kind of what to do with all this brain stuff, and how to use it. So I'm almost just wanting to kind of comb for anything that's been on your mind or also anything that you're interested in going forward before we wrap up, because I know that you're going to have to go soon. One of the things I really find myself interested in is that I have found having an awareness and a knowledge of certain core principles of interpersonal neurobiology has been essential for me to develop any kind of this ongoing, calmer, more receptive state. And I really am interested in some of these core principles being widely disseminated. I think that Steve Porges's work is crucial to understanding who we are as human beings. I think that's true for Ian McGilchrist's work on the two hemispheres and certainly to understand that people, that we have implicit memories that are constantly shaping our responses and to understand uh, how attachment patterns get, you know, continually acted out. I've, I just keep imagining that if some of these core principles could be taught from kindergarten on and in developmentally appropriate ways, that we would find ways to be kinder to one another, to take care of the vulnerable in our society, to consume less, to take care of our earth, and that we would find ways to be with one another that are really beautiful and are available to us. You know, Freud said, the picture Freud had painted a long time ago was we were kind of this wild id that had to be sat on in some ways. It turns out that's not even close to true. And I Thank Freud. None of us would be sitting here if it weren't for Freud. This is, he was a master of so much. But that core view is not accurate according to neurobiology. What we know is, is that a child who receives a kind of tender, secure care at, at the beginning of life, by the time they're three years old, is going to be a naturally empathic human being, 33% with rupture and repair. But we are really designed to be in these warm, wonderful relationships with each other if we can just have the care that we need both as kids and then if things go wrong there later on. We're designed for that. I just have such hope for society, but I would love to see there be a curriculum starting very, very young about these core ways that we are human. 
I totally love that. And, you know, I have a similar passion that's part of us doing this podcast and trying to get it out. You know, we're heard in 122 countries. And again, a lot by people that aren't at all in the mental health profession. So there are a lot of people that are learning about this and that are interested in it. And I think it's happening. I think people, it's getting into the mainstream for sure. Some clients told me that it, attachment now is happy hour conversation. <laughs> and I also heard that there was a improv show on attachment specifically. So I know that's not exactly what you were talking about, but certainly the neuro stuff is in there. So that's all great news. So, so Bonnie, how could interested audience members find you or find some of your material? And by the way, everybody, she gave the most very interesting summation of some of this material that she's talking about getting out further. It will be on our show notes that you can find at therapistuncensored.com under this particular episode and what else will be on there. Certainly more information about her programs, her website, things like that. But please go ahead and state anything about your courses, your immersion, your books, anything like that. Go ahead and let everybody know. Well, you're welcome to write to us at Bonnie at NurturingTheHeart.org, our organization. We have a, a nonprofit organization, Nurturing the Heart with the Brain in Mind. And so we would love to hear from you. We do for therapists, but also others who are just interested in personal growth. We do a year-long immersion program that meets for three days, four times a year. And the people that come are remarkable. There's 14 people in each group. My partner Joe and I teach it, and it's really quite amazing experience to have people be here with us. So there's that, and the books will be on the show notes. The Heart of Trauma, Healing the Embodied Brain is the latest one, and so... I have to add that uh, some of the people that I know that are in Bonnie's immersion courses, they are just total fan. I don't want to say fan girls because that's diminutive, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just like they get, you know, they, you get, they get the big hearts in their eyes and they're like, oh, Bonnie, you know, <laughs> and they just, it, you can just tell that they have gotten so much from the experience and they just gush over it. And I think that it's really, the reason is because I think it's, they've been fundamentally changed. One of the very cool things about Bonnie is she's not like one of these people where you have to kind of worship a guru in order to be part of the deal. You know, she's very non-narcissistic <laughs> and really is interested in giving you your own experience and really you leaving with something where that you're more full and more healed. So that's what I have to say about Bonnie Badenoch. How about that? <laughs> What I would say is, is the reason that people come away from these groups is they come already with the wish to practice presence, and that's what we do with each other. We work hard at learning also, but we practice presence with each other, and it is transformative to get to do that and healing and all of that. So we do fan tray and other good stuff too, but there's there's a way that these groups become this reflective pool of listening for one another that is really remarkable and very healing for me and Joe too. So... We're grateful to have Mel here. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, well, uh, hopefully we can stay in touch. And in the meantime, I know you've got to go. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sue. Thanks so much. <laughs> Bye-bye. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you so much for listening all the way through. We really appreciate it. And we especially appreciate those of you who have taken the time to leave ratings and reviews. And we want to give a shout out to some of you who have done that. Evansville Rocks from the U.S., said that their mind was blown and that they particularly appreciated how we integrated research based on studies, neurophysiology, and real life experiences to discuss trauma and attachment and how it impacts human development. And that most importantly, by the end of the podcast, that suggestions were made that empowers change for dysfunctional patterns. So it's not just all bad news. So thank you very much for that feedback passionate about attachment in Australia also said that we were their favorite podcast and that it really helped them to understand attachment in a deep way. So crush me baby from the U S said that it was beautiful and enlightening and then they're moved by listening and that the ideas were groundbreaking. And then JG from the U S said that it was clear, grounded, kind and supportive conversations on attachment styles and in particular, that me, oh my, that the preoccupied uh, relationship episode was spot on. 
And what that they're referring to is there's particular episodes, 59, 60, and 61. And there are others as well, but those are the ones that we particularly focus on that. Those are some of the ones that they're referring to. But they say that it's optimistic, normative, not inhuman diagnostic, and non-judgmental, including with helpful tips. And they called it a gift. So thank you, JG. And then we'll end with Halloween Queen in 99 from Canada. Excellent podcast, very interesting topic and incredible guests. They love it, but they have a suggestion. And one of the things that they were having trouble with is, as we said, for example, I just said 59, 60, and 61. But when you go to iTunes, iTunes has suggested that we not label the actual numbers. And because of this exact feedback, thank you, Halloween Queen, we have changed that. They had told us not to put episode numbers in the title now we are going back and we are adding the episode numbers. So it'll be easier to find. But if you're still having trouble with any of that, just go to our website because their episode numbers are in there. But we do listen to those kinds of feedback. Actually, let me give you one more. And we are going to continue to give shout outs to those of you who leave any kind of feedback, including if you leave feedback on our voicemail, which is on our website, we will actually play it so you can hear your voice and we want any feedback. So even something like that, that's constructive criticism, we will listen. Cat Lady from the US said that this is a podcast that she continues to like more and more, probably because we get better and better at it because we really are amateurs and we're figuring it out as we go. But uh, she says that she finds the content interesting and the host human and that we don't make her hate humanity, quite the opposite, that she finds herself taking notes and saying, yes, that's it. Uh, she finds it validating and without being judgmental towards anyone. And that it's a great resource about attachment. That means so much to us because we are not into the business of division. So uh, those are a few of the feedbacks that we have gotten. We would love more. And one of the best things you could do to support us if you're liking this content is to share freely and especially to give honest ratings and reviews on your favorite podcast player. The other thing, if you want to stay in touch, is be sure and join our Facebook page. It's Austin Shrinks on Facebook. There's also a private Facebook page that if you join our email list, that way you can talk to one another. And we want to support the community. And that way, if you have your own links or ideas or references or questions or feedback about a particular episode, you can talk to each other or ask questions or anything like that. Just join the actual email list and just let us know who you are and we will hook you right up with the private Facebook page and encourage feedback directly with one another. So I think that is it. Thank you very much for listening and we will see you right around the bend and we have a lot more coming at you. Take care. Bye-bye. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 